Okay, great. Thanks, Brad. And um, welcome everybody to sunny Boulder, Colorado. It's uh, uh, where life is full of surprises. Uh, my apologies to those of you caught up in the, the bus debacle. Um, I'm glad everybody seems to have arrived safe and sound. And as they say on airlines, we'll make up the time en route. Uh, okay, so as Brad mentioned, this is the first annual meeting of Systems 3.0. So we had Systems 1.0 starting in 2007, 2.0 in 2012. Now we're in systems 3.0. So I wanna first thank the National Science Foundation who underwrite this, um, this community effort and this community. And this year I also wanna uh, give a special thanks to Kwasi. Uh, and you're gonna, you're gonna hear more about Kwasi and their mission and how Kwasi and CSTMS have been working together, I think in various ways in this meeting and you'll hear from uh, Jared Bales in a few minutes to learn a little bit about Kwasi. So I think Brad has, has nicely explained a little bit about our theme this year of bridging boundaries. We're bridging boundaries across natural systems, human systems, and we're bridging boundaries between one another, learning from one another, um, learning new tips and techniques. We're making new friends. And of course, that makes the science enterprise better and it, and it makes more fun. So that's bridging boundaries. So I'll say a few words about uh, some updates from the community and, and a little bit from the integration facility. So our community is growing. And uh, on the upper left here is a chart showing our numbers, the CSDMS members through time over the past 10 years. So we haven't been necessarily trying to grow, but growth has happened organically on its own. Earlier this month, we hit a milestone, 1,800 of you as CSDMS members. Um, and it's an international group. So we're represented currently by 70 different countries. Um, how many of you are here for the very first CSDMS meeting you've attended? Raise your hands. Oh, good, so about half of you. So welcome, special welcome to those of you who are at your first meeting, hopefully the first of many. Um, as you may or may not know, the community is organized into a collection of focus and working groups. You see them listed here. Um, you'll have the opportunity to meet the chairs of the working groups you're interested in, in, uh, in later today when we do our breakout group meetings. Um, we have a couple of new co-chairs this year, and I want to um, I want to uh, welcome them. So, joining Nicole Gasparini as a new co-chair of the terrestrial group, we have Leslie Sheaf from the USGS, um, and joining Courtney Harris as co-chair of the Marine Working Group, we have Mike Steckler from Lamont Doherty. So, welcome and thank you to Leslie and Mike. Okay, so on the note of community, um, there's one other kind of boundary bridging that I want to. I want to say a few words about. You know, it's, it's unfortunately the case that in the world of, of science, at least in the United States, in recent history, that the community, the science community as a whole, has not been equally welcoming to everybody for reasons that have nothing to do with the science and everything to do with social and, and, and uh, historical factors. So it feels really important to say loudly and clearly and frequently that the CSTMS community is an inclusive and open community. It's for everybody. And so, so if you're male or female or non-binary, if you are young or old, whatever your height, your size, your color, your background, if you're interested in the things this community does, then you're welcome here and you belong here. Okay? So I think that's, let's recognize that. So on the other hand, this is an easy for th thing for someone like me to say. And the reality is that the various science communities have a ways to go. So in geosciences in the US, for example, although things have gotten better, the geoscience community still doesn't look as a whole like the American population. And so to help us all collectively think about what we can do to make that situation better, we're going to have a special event toward the, as the capstone event of this meeting on Thursday afternoon. We're going to do a panel discussion on the issue of equity, diversity, and inclusivity, and share some ideas and get some information about what, what can we all do to make sure that this community is open to everybody and all the talent out there that's interested is at the table. So look forward to that on Thursday. Okay, so uh, a couple of thanks. First, the integration facility staff. Um, uh, many of you know these folks, so this is a collection of folks here who are supported by NSF to do the put on meetings like this one and provide the products and services that you've come to know and love. 
Um, so thank your local integration facility member when you meet them uh, in the comings and goings. I also want to put a special thanks to those who have put on pre-meeting workshops. So um, we had a pre-meeting workshop yesterday on software carpentry led by Mark Piper, Mariella Perignon, and Charlie Schober. You guys raise your hands. There you are. Okay. Um, thank you. This is a, in, in some ways a kind of a bittersweet thank you to Marielle in particular because we say goodbye to her later this month as she heads off to embark on a new career in data analytics in Chicago. So thank you, Marielle, and, and good wishes. I also want to uh, give special thanks to Jeff Karras. Where's Jeff? Um, thank you, Jeff, for, for leading a fabulous uh, uh, short course on quantifying uncertainty, hugely important topic in our science. These folks are volunteers who have volunteered their time to make these, uh, these lessons available to you. Okay, so I'll say a few words about updates from the integration facility. As you may know, there are sort of three key areas that CSUMS works in. There's community support and development, enhancing research and discovery. There's computing resources, and there's education. Um, when CSTMS first started, one of the first experiments um, that the integration facility tried was, hey, if we make a web portal and invite people to openly share their codes, will they do it? This was a time when codes were trade secrets, circa 2007. And the answer was a resounding yes to that experiment. Yes, people are willing to share and happy to share and eager to share. And so as a result, we now have a model repository that has 229 models, 89 tools, and the list keeps growing every year. So here's a, a, a list of some of the, the codes that you all have donated um, over the past year. So thank you all for making your hard work accessible to the rest of the community so that your, your impacts are, are bigger and deeper. Um, another thing that the integration facility does is to provide support for you all in doing your science, um, both through developing proposals and through the sort of project phase. So, some of the things that we can, we can offer you are um, in the proposal support category. We write a lot of letters of support. And we're happy to do that. Um, we can provide help with broader impacts, thinking about how to turn your models into educational resources or to make them more broadly accessible. We can help you with data management plans. In terms of project support, so we've, we've supported PIs for a long time in an informal way. We want to make that a little bit more formal so it's more visible to the entire community rather than people who sort of feel they know us well enough to pick up the phone. We can do this in a variety of ways. We can provide a, a limited amount of consulting with our software engineers are, are, are there to sort of help you deal with things like how do, you, how do you engineer a model so that it'll work in a framework and that kind of thing. If you have a, a more extensive need, we're happy to collaborate with you. We do a lot of sort of sub awards on, on proposals and that kind of thing. We often have site visits, so somebody will come out for a day or two days or a week or something like that, and we'll work with you here in Boulder. So know that those resources are available, and you can find out more on the website if you go to services. One um, new service that we just rolled out last month is the help desk. So here's the URL. And so this is a, a, essentially a web portal through GitHub where if you have questions about one of our frameworks, about the basic model interface, which we'll talk about in a minute, about particular models, uh, post your question here and we'll do our best to help you. And if we don't know the answer, we'll try to steer you to, to people who do. So take advantage of that. As you know, we also coordinate meetings like this one. Um, Brad mentioned last year's meeting on the theme of natural hazards. So we have a special issue um, in the journal NHESS, Natural Hazards in Earth System Science, um, on computational modeling of geoprocesses and geohazards. So you're in luck because the deadline for submission isn't for another month. So if you have something relevant, um, see Albert. Albert is there, the guy with his hand up. Um, I think it'll be an exciting issue. So here's a, a sampling of some of the papers that, that have come in so far. The topics range from droughts to um, storm surge and coastal storms, riverine floods, post wildfire flooding, seismic hazards, and you name it. So I think that'll be a great issue. Hardware and software. So, so for many years, CSTMS has provided a sort of a modest supercomputing facility for those of you who want to get into supercomputing and, and try it out and develop, develop a familiarity with it. So we still do that. 
our old facility beach has wound down and we're now using and offering to you all if you need it um, a cluster of nodes on a shared system here at CU Boulder called Blanca and what it lacks a number of cores it makes up for in speed and memory um, once you've developed your sort of bona fides and demonstrated that you know what you're doing on an HPC facility we can help you translate that to a bigger higher performance system there's one system that several of you are using here at CU. It's an NSF funded facility called Summit. It has nearly 10,000 cores. So there's lots of, um, lots of computing power to be had. Um, let me tell you a little bit about uh, model coupling and model frameworks. So another experiment that CSDMS tried early on was Having heard from the community, from you all, that we don't want one single large model, that would have in some ways been simple, like right? know how to make a code and maintain it. But it was clear that from you all, the community, that what we needed as a solution was a modular plug and play environment that would be able to span the many different scales, processes, environments that you all work in. And that's a harder challenge. So one of the first questions was, is this possible? Is it feasible? A and B, what would be required? And so one of the lessons learned that one of the, that you need a couple of things. You need multi-language capability. You need uh, a vocabulary, and that's led to Scott's work on geoscience standard names. And you need a model interface standard. So let me tell you about an interface standard. So, you know, probably most of you here have a driver's license and have driven some kind of a motor vehicle. Maybe some of you even rented a motor vehicle when you flew in. And you probably took it for granted that regardless of what you rented, whether it was something small or something slightly larger, you know, sometimes they upgrade you, uh, that whatever you're driving, whether it's a dump truck or, a, you know, a Humvee or whatever, uh, it's going to have a standard interface. Right? So the standard interface for a model code is the same idea, right? And so we've developed at CSMS this basic model interface. It's really just a list of functions. And if the model provides those functions, then you can say it, it's standardized and it can be easily brought into a coupling framework, whether one of the ones we've developed here or others out there elsewhere. And the, you know, it's not, it's not rocket science in a way, it's pretty simple. The kind of functions you need are something like, okay, I wanna start my model and give it some inputs. I wanna run it for some period of time or if it's a one-time thing, ask it to do its thing. I might want to interrogate its values. What's the sea level? What's the sediment thickness? What's the discharge? What's the biomass? Whatever it may be. When well, I may even want to modify values, and this is the key to coupling, that I can modify ma values in the model while it's running. Um, well, we do that with cars too, right? And then when all is said and done, we want to clean things up and shut down smoothly, right? So th those are five of the, the BMI functions. And so we have, if you want to learn about the BMI and how you can add it to your code, if you're a model developer, there's several places you can look. There's a, a paper by Scott and Eric and Boyana. There's a clinic happening later today, uh, led by Mark. There's a website where you can learn all about the BMI. We even have now a webinar about BMI. So you have no excuses <laughs> to learn about the BMI. So once you have wrapped a model with a standardized interface, then it can be brought into a model framework. Um, and that was another of the experiments early on. Okay, can we build a model framework that would accept different codes written in different languages and allow people to couple them together where that makes sense or to run single ones? That led ultimately to what's called the web modeling tool. Some of you have used before. It's basically a browser application where you configure one or more models as Components, you string them together, you set their inputs, and you say go. When you say go, the run is launched on the supercomputer behind the scenes. So this was cloud computing before cloud computing was a thing. So, so you could, we didn't exactly invent cloud computing. We didn't know we were doing it, but we were doing it. And we're still doing it. So another thing we learned, though, from by, by looking at the community and studying how you all work, we learned that Many of us need, including me, need for many of the things we do, we need a, a way to get our, get our hands dirty, so to speak, with code. We need to be able to write code that gives us the level of control that we can do the kinds of problems we want to do, whether it's bringing in the right sorts of data, um, managing our models, and so on. And so to try and meet that need, we've developed a programmatic um, 
version of our coupling framework called the Python modeling tool or PyMT. So this is a, essentially a little Python package that allows you to run and if you need to couple models as components through a Python interface, a notebook, a, a web or a, 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 a command line environment or what have you, a script. Um, there's an example coupling together a uh, un, uh, irregular grid-based landscape model with a grid-based delta model, right? And because they have standardized interface, each of the models in this system looks and feels the same. It has the same steering wheel and so on. So here's a list of the uh, model components that currently exist in the system. The list is going to keep growing, we hope. There's about a dozen of them now, roughly color-coded according to theme. So there's some cryosphere-related ones, some fluvial ones, some uh, coastal and marine ones, some hill slopey sorts of things, and so on. Um, I'll highlight one thing to, to make an uh, there's one point I want to make about this. This EC Simple Snow Model, it's the most recent model added, a snow model from Environment Canada. Um, Dr. Kong Wong did the uh, engineering to create a BMI around this model. Um, and he was able to successfully take a model written in a fairly old flavor of Fortran and get it to be a component operating in a Python environment. Right? So that's, that's an achievement. Here's a little bit of output from the Simple Snow Model. So it turns out we now have, some of you have heard of or have worked with LandLab. LandLab components can now be easily translated into PyMT components. If, if you want to do that, here are some of the LandLab components, around 20 or so of them total, I think, at the moment. So that's PyMT, and there's a, going to be a clinic um, on that, I think, tomorrow. On the educational front, um, Irina and, and gang have been working hard to try to translate some of our lab exercises into PyMT. So you can look for those in the PyMT um, sort of learning collection. If you look at uh, for examples on the PyMT website, you'll find notebooks like this that will walk a group of students through some exercises using one of these models. Speaking of LandLab, um, development continues on LandLab. So this is a, a team with, that started out within the terrestrial group, um, creating a, a basically a, a Again, a Python language environment for being able to efficiently assemble models from component parts. So you can make a grid, regular or irregular or hexagonal or whatever you like. You can populate it with data. You can create or pick up and use interchangeable process components. Here's a picture of a few of the applications that have been written and published with LandLab in the last couple of years. Um, on the teaching front, Nicole Gasparini has um, produced a wonderful set of teaching tools for LandLab, including exercises both in geomorphology and surface water hydrology. So you can find those through the LandLab website. They're, they're set up and they've been, they're now the veterans of several different um, class exercises. Finally, on the educational front, we've introduced, as some of you know, a set of uh, webinars. So. We have now in the library about six webinars. They're online, so if you missed it when it was live, you can go and watch the recording. You can even hit the speed up button so you can hear, you know, you can hear Mark talking at double speed. His voice doesn't change. It's a miracle of modern technology. Um, so if anybody has ideas about webinars that you would like to give or ideas about webinars you'd like to see, let us know, and, and uh, we'll put it on the schedule. So we're, we're going to continue this series again in the fall. Okay, so that was a quick tour of some of the resources. I want to just tell you one quick story before we um, wrap up here, and it's a story about why modular standardized modeling software is a good thing. Well, I think you, everyone gets the idea that if you want to couple models together to look at crossing boundaries and interface problems, yeah, you need to standardize them, couple them. But what if you're doing something simpler? Here's a little story um, with thanks to Simon Kubler, um, for contributing this. He didn't know he was contributing it, but he contributed it. Um, so Simon is a, a visiting scientist from the University of Munich, and he's gotten very interested in lakes and how lakes in tectonically extensional regimes like East Africa and Oregon, which is where this picture is from, there's Simon, um, how the rise and fall of the lake levels would have influenced animal migration patterns in these rugged landscapes, and how those animal migration patterns might in turn have influenced where prehistoric humans went to hunt them. So it has archaeological implications, sort of an interesting problem. But here's the thing, if you're going to worry about paleo lake elevations, and if 
differences of a meter or two matter because there's very low topography between lakes, then you have to think about isostasy, right? G.K. Gilbert taught us this in the Bonneville Basin back in the 19th century. So gosh, we really ought to do an isostatic calculation. But what a pain in the neck that would be, right? If, if you've ever written an isostatic 2D flexure code, Andy, um, this is a lot of work, right? I mean, it's, you have to think about an elastic sheet and you have to think about Kelvin vessel functions and you need to set up a grid and you need to debug it and then you need to debug the bugs that you introduced by debugging it, right? You know where I'm talking about. But here we had a component, two components, in fact. We had our pick that already did 2D elastic flexure with a standardized interface. So instead of having to spend months writing this and debugging it and so on, in a few hours, we had a little application that would take that component and give it a DEM and a lake level, and it would find the flexural response to the load of that lake. And so we end up with pictures like this that show this area with the red color being the, the flexural rebound once the water is evaporated in the Holocene. So, so plug and play, in addition to lending you couple models, it turns what starts out as would be months of work into hours of work. And that's a good thing that lets us do, I mean, think about if, if your papers took hours to write instead of months to write, that would be, that would be we'd all get tenure in six months. Um, okay, all right, so last couple of things I wanna say that our awards program, we're gonna have the awards banquet on Wednesday night. We're gonna be honoring um, a few people. One of them is uh, our student, Savitsky Student Modeler Award to Letty Roach. Um, from the National Institute of Water and Atmospheric Research in New Zealand. Um, she's being honored for developing um, modeling software for ice flows and doing a good job of that. Um, she won't actually be able to join us, but we will honor her and she'll come to the meeting next year. Um, we're gonna be honoring the winner of the poster competition. So that winner is a mystery person because we haven't had our poster session yet, so, but you all have to vote. So this afternoon and tomorrow afternoon, you're gonna see some amazing posters um, and you can't vote for all of them. You can only vote for one. You can vote early, but you can't vote often. And um, so make sure to vote and we'll announce the winner tomorrow night at the banquet. Our other award, of course, is the, is the Lifetime Achievement Award. And I'm thrilled that we're gonna be honoring Jaya Savitsky as our, our Lifetime Award winner. I'm gonna embarrass Jaya and ask her to raise her hand. Hello. So, So, so you'll learn a little bit more about uh, Jaya's uh, achievements and, and hear from some, um, some folks who, rumor has it, may be doing a little light roasting, hopefully. Hopefully not, hopefully fairly light, we'll see. Okay, so, um, so here's the plan of the next three days. We, we're a little bit behind schedule, but that's okay. We're gonna make this up en route, as they say. Um, we're gonna start with a set of keynote talks next. We'll have then breakout groups, Linux in the afternoon, a few more keynote talks and then posters, and we'll be sort of alternating between those activities through the next three days. Let me say quickly about breakout groups. So today you're gonna to meet with um, CSGMS focus and research groups, and the breakouts will be led by the chairs of those groups. Tomorrow and Thursday, they're gonna to be topic-based topic -based breakout groups, and so you can sign up for the topics that you find most intriguing out of the front tables. Um, what we're really looking for in these, these Wednesday and Thursday breakouts is your ideas about potential proof of concept application. How can we use the, the concepts and the technologies and the ideas that CSTMS 1 and 2 created to create demonstration projects that, that essentially the technology helps turn high hanging fruit into low hanging fruit. So we're looking for your, your ideas in that. I think it should be, these should be fun conversations. Um, okay, I think that's, that's all I have to say. Lynn, am I forgetting to say anything? Anybody, integration facility people, are there any other logistics we need to cover? 